Okay. Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Dr. Bob Herto, and on behalf, I'm the director of the LMU Center for Religion and Spirituality. And on behalf of the center, it's my good pleasure to welcome you this evening. Excuse me. I'm sorry. It's my good pleasure to welcome you this evening to, to our reflection on the year of St. Joseph. Indeed, we are gathering on the eve of the solemnity of St. Joseph. So this is an especially good moment for reflecting on this year the church has set aside. I'd also like to welcome our two main conversation partners this evening, Father Alan Deck of the Society of Jesus and Sister Cecilia McGladry of the Sisters of St. Joseph of Orange. I will introduce each of them in just a moment. St. Joseph is best known as the husband of Mary and foster father to Jesus, but of course he grew up in a human family. The story is told that when St. Joseph's own father was very ill and on his deathbed, he could barely see, only shadows, but he could still talk. He turned to his wife and said, is David my oldest son here? <laughs> yes, came the answer. Is Eli my middle son here? Yes, he is here too. Is Joseph here too? Yes, yes, everyone is here. <laughs> if everyone is here, why is the light in the kitchen on? Okay. Please pardon this weak attempt at humor, but have you ever noticed that the jokes about St. Joseph carry everyday themes of family relations and work and personal responsibility and finding purpose in our everyday lives? It seems the most important lessons we can learn from St. Joseph have to do with how he handled himself, how he handled himself amid both the everyday and the extraordinary circumstances of life. He became an example for us all by defending, protecting, and caring for his family, as Pope Francis reminds us in Patris Corde, with a father's heart, the Pope's letter on the year of St. Joseph. Tonight, we have invited Father Allen and Sister Cecilia to share reflections on the inspiration that St. Joseph provides, to, provides today for believers everywhere. Along the way, we will learn more about how a year focused on St. Joseph fits with Pope Francis's vision for the church, and also about why St. Joseph is a patron of so many religious communities and parishes. We will also have some time for all of us to participate in a discussion. We expect to be wrapping up around 8.15 p.m. Pacific time. So to get started, let me introduce our two conversation partners. Alan Figueroa Deck is, is distinguished scholar in pastoral theology and Latino studies and holds a dual appointment as a lecture, as lecturer in the departments of theological studies and Chicano Latino studies at Loyola Marymount University. Father Dak is the author or editor of nine books and more than 60 chapters and journal articles on pastoral theology, Latino, Latino studies, Ch Catholic social teaching, spirituality, and intercultural competence. His latest book is Francis, Bishop of Rome, The Gospel for the Third Millennium. Cecilia McGladry, CSJ, is Assistant Sup General Superior of the Sisters of St. Joseph of Orange and a teacher in the Ignatian spirituality tradition. Former supervisor of the Art of Spiritual Direction program and therefore a, a colleague of mine in, in, the, in the center, uh, a three-year formation, which is a three-year formation pro program for spiritual directors. She presents programs, does retreat work and engages in spiritual directions and the supervision of spiritual directors. To begin our program tonight, Sister Cecilia and Father Allen, would you lead us in prayer? Good evening. This evening, um, our prayer is based on the work of Sister Madaliva Williams. And Sister Madaliva is, is a sister of St. Joseph for, of Orange, who for a number of years has, has prepared posters on the life of Joseph um, and 
reflected on his life. And so this litany that, that uh, Father Alan and I will pray tonight, and you can pray along with us, will it, is based on some of her reflections on the meaning of Joseph. And the artwork that you see on the slides are some of her posters that she has presented over the years. So before we begin, let's just take a moment of silence to gather all that we have and all that we are right now in this moment and present it to our loving God. St. Joseph, man with a common touch. St. Joseph, committed to respecting the dignity of his wife and son. St. Joseph, a great man for facing life as it comes, being content with the daily what we call ordinary. St. Joseph, not much is known about him. He is husband, father, provider every day. What more can be said? St. Joseph, a dreamer, his dreams were not always clear or easy, but eventually they changed his mind and heart. St. Joseph, a common worker, no name but carpenter. St. Joseph, considered each person, each place as neighbor for the child he called son treated none as stranger. St. Joseph, a just man, someone you could count on, upright and downright. St. Joseph, a parent, he knew the ups and downs, the day by day way of love and letting go. St. Joseph, of his plans, all that was left was broken. Yet, he learned what was left was enough. St. Joseph, for him it wasn't a question of success. It was being faithful to the mix we call life. St. Joseph, caught in the grip of fear, came to rely on the presence that says, do not be afraid. St. Joseph, before closed doors in his own empty hands, turned to hope. Hope that finds a way when there is none. St. Joseph found his life in ordinary days, no clutter of ifs or buts, simply in what we call now. St. Joseph, over time, might have seen waiting as a perfect gift. How else can we be ready for the next moment? St. Joseph, at times, like so many, was a refugee without home, welcome, or work. So what he could do, he did. It made all the difference. St. Joseph must have seen the possibilities in the given and take of daily conversation perhaps because he was a builder. St. Joseph, as a day laborer, had little, 
yet he had compassion. And that was everything. St. Joseph met deep losses with deepest care. Perhaps not immediately, but day by day. And so let us pray in the words of our Pope Francis. Hail guardian of the Redeemer, spouse of the Blessed Virgin Mary. To you, God entrusted his only son. In you, Mary placed her trust. With you, Christ became man. Blessed Joseph, to us too show yourself a father and guide us in the path of life. Obtain for us grace mercy and courage, and defend us from all evil. Amen. Well, thank you very much, uh, Sister Cecilia, for that beautiful prayer. It reminds me of uh, all the ways that Sister Madeleva Williams uh, inspired us and several years when I worked in Orange at the Mother House with, with her and other members of your congregation. Um, I'm here to begin our reflection um, on Joseph, uh, basing my remarks pretty much on the remarkable uh, letter that uh, Pope Francis wrote when he proclaimed uh, the year of St. Joseph, which began on the 8th of December uh, in 2020, and will continue until this coming 8th of December. Uh, in, in the letter, I mean, he really, he really did a very good job of uh, communicating to us all of the various um, ways in which we have come to understand a figure in the church who is more unusual because of the different ways in which his, his presence has been understood and interpreted uh, in the history of Christianity. But there's no doubt that for various reasons, and maybe I'll mention some of them here, uh, friend, uh, Joseph seems to be coming into his own uh, you know, when the, when the church uh, want, raised the presence of Joseph in the 19th century, you know, making Joseph, for instance, the patron of the universal church, uh, there's no doubt that the church was living a moment of defensiveness. And so Joseph, of course, was viewed as a guardian. And it's kind of interesting uh, that that focus on Joseph that started thinking of him as someone who protects, which is, you know, makes sense. He was the father, after all, of, of the family, and he did view himself, no doubt, as a protector. But we live at a time when, unlike the 19th century, when this devotion began to be pushed, I think, very much by, by Rome, uh, the church is not taking a defensive posture. I think those of us who were born before Vatican II know about that kind of Catholicism. But there's a new kind, you might say, of Catholicism, one inspired on the reform of the Second Vatican Council, especially on Pope Francis, that views the church as, you know, as Francis puts it in Spanish, siempre en salida, always going out. Not a defensive church, but an engaging church. And so the first thing that I want to say about the figure of Francis, like, you know, so many saints in the church that, that give testimony to how you, we really can live our faith. Joseph really represents someone who wasn't just, you know, out there with his rifle or something, defending the church and his, the Holy Family, but someone who took initiatives in response to what was happening to the reality of what was happening and who learned how to, yes, very much go with the punches, who had undoubtedly and modeled 
I would say, for us. A spirituality that is looking at the real. In other words, uh, not expecting life to bring with it, you know, or, or to, to be uh, the ideal that we, that we dream about, but also what is, what is going on. And Joseph had a great ability to uh, respond, respond with compassion, with care, with attention to what really was. Um, Joseph was a man of faith, not unlike uh, Mary, the mother of Jesus, in that undoubtedly he, he, he was challenged to cooperate with what really, no matter how you look at it, is an incredible mystery. It's called the mystery of the incarnation. And it had to do with how God totally identifies with our human reality, except as we know in sin. But in but really, uh, can anybody get their head around how that happens? How that happened? How that is? That kind of an incarnation that that uh, penetrating of the divine, if you will into the reality of the human and into our uh, material existence, our historical existence, uh, not just as a people, but also as individuals, as, as, as persons. So Joseph cooperated in that incredible story, which C.S. Lewis, for instance, the great English writer, uh, Irish writer, I think, Northern Irish writer, liked to talk about as the greatest story ever told, the story of the incarnation. So we have to really, at least I think it makes sense. And the, and the Holy Father uh, in his letter, uh, you know, talks about Joseph, the man of faith. Something that I wasn't aware of, but it makes eminent sense to me, is that uh, Francis talks about Joseph as the patron of the internal forum. I don't think I'd ever heard that before, but as I began to think about it, it made more, more and more sense because what was going on with Joseph uh, in several ways, his conformity to the external, you know, customs and norms of, of his Jewish faith, of his Middle Eastern culture were being tremendously challenged uh, if not torpedoed uh, by what God was asking in the incarnation. And so um, Joseph didn't simply respond to this challenge in some simplistic way. But we know, and perhaps that's why we identify Joseph as a man of silence, because silence creates the condition by which we can discern. I mean, by which you can hear, we can hear. And Joseph was trying to hear, and he was trying to uh, assimilate into his, his whole being, into his response, uh, a loving, compassionate response to what God was asking of him. And the way that we know that that occurs is that uh, Joseph didn't fly off the handle and, for instance, denounce Mary for, yes, having, having a child out of wedlock, because that's what it was, um, but rather he pondered, didn't he? He pondered. And not only did he ponder, and I suppose we could say pray about it, um, what, what should he do in the face of this? Uh, but we hear several times, I think it's three or four times, uh, that something happened to him in a dream. And we can ask ourselves, well, what does that have to do with the internal form? Or what does that have to do with our, our moral responses? Well, you know, I think it has something to do with um, getting in touch with our whole 
being. Because, you know, as we know, uh, I'm not a psychologist, but we know that, that the dream uh, does frequently become the vehicle for us to gain notice or to get in touch with what's deeply affecting us, what's, what we're deeply feeling, uh, what's going on internally. And so when we speak about Joseph in that way, um, I think we begin to see how it fits with being a man of faith who is responding, but he's responding in a prayerful, attentive, listening, you know, not just doing things or, or, have, or feeling compelled, you know, to respond this way or that way, but bringing uh, God and uh, the community and others into his uh, reflections on, on, on all of this. Well, another way to look at it was uh, Joseph put time into being uh, integral or living a life of real uh, integrity integrity, not just following the rules or fitting in with the culture or fitting in with, you know, what people would think or whatever, but rather a truly uh, authentic person of integrity. And there's a lot to be said uh, about that. The other point, we identify Joseph sometimes with the pursuit of justice. And uh, I, was at, I was thinking, well, yeah, how, why is that? Why do we speak of Joseph that way? Well, Francis once again brings this up because he reminds us, as Joseph reminds us, that the fullness of justice is mercy. And in his response to, you know, the dilemma that he had in hearing about Mary's pregnancy, for instance, he didn't do the standard macho thing, but rather, if anything, he, he showed considerable mercy and gave Mary more than the benefit of the doubt. And so that's a very straight, simple example, but it's one that I think uh, the church today more than ever wants to communicate is that uh, yes, God is just and God is merciful, but God's mercy is, thank God, above his justice. And that is the example that I think that we see in, uh, in the figure of Joseph. We also know that at different times in history, the church has been challenged to get its act together. And certainly in the 19th century, uh, the institutional church was challenged by the fact that it really had lost the working class, at least in Europe, it had lost the working class. And that was precisely what got Pope, Pope Leo XIII you know, into gear to begin really uh, in a very forceful and creative way, the tradition of Catholic social teaching. And in the context of that period, which the church I think is still very much promoting, the identification with workers, the identification with, yes, also the poor, the option for the poor as uh, Pope St. Uh, John Paul II has insisted, you know, with the option for the poor, all of that. Early on, the church saw that, oh, we have someone to model this. And of course, it's Joseph, the foster father of Jesus, who was an ordinary worker. Um, and who was the, the, the person who brought home, you know, put food on the table so that Jesus could grow into the man that he became. Okay. 
Now, one of the other, and this is all shows you all of the images and all of the uh, qualities that uh, we know about Joseph, even though you know, people will complain that there's not a great deal in the New Testament about Joseph, which is true. But what's there is dynamite. And especially if you pray with it, especially if you use your imagination to sink into what, what's going on here. And the other example I will give you will be the flight into Egypt. In the, in the 1950s, at the end of the Second World War, when uh, Europe had been devastated by that terrible, terrible uh, experience, and people were displaced, all kinds of peoples were displaced as a result of the devastation of that war, uh, the church looked for a way to respond in a compassionate and accompanying way to the struggle of so many people that was going on at that time. Okay, we can compare that moment to the moment we're living now, which is one of, by the way, even more displacement of people, huh? even more than the Second World War. But at that moment, the church once again looked to the figure of Joseph and uh, pointed out that Joseph and Mary, yes, and Jesus, the holy family, as we say, are the model for refugees and immigrants of all time. Because the church's concern, or our concern, or the concern of Christians then and now for refugees and immigrants and displaced persons and the outsiders and the peripheral, or whatever you want to call them, isn't some kind of nice idea. But it goes to the very heart of, of God that we've come to know in the incarnation and in the person of Jesus. Huh? And that those around Jesus, that cooperated with, with the plan, like Joseph, really modeled to us the care and the attention. And by the way, in this case, courage that was needed because what did Joseph do? He uh, actually responded quite intelligently and, uh, and uh, uh, he came out quickly made, making the decision to flee to Egypt with the Holy Family. And so Joseph and Mary and Jesus himself from the earliest times of Jesus' life became refugees. So that our concern about refugees is so intimately linked to the story of, of our salvation and of the, the, the Paschal mystery of Jesus himself. Huh? And Joseph was such an important figure. You've all seen in Really, during our time, we've we've had the benefit. Maybe we'll see some a little bit later, of Joseph representing the flight. Uh, you know, the flight in different ways that that's been represented in Christian art, huh? But how appropriate, huh, for the moment that we're living right now. Um, so, as a refugee, what was Joseph facing? He was facing threats. He was facing dangers. He was facing the unknown. He was uprooting his life. If, if already his life hadn't already been uprooted enough by getting involved with Mary in the first place, it really was getting uprooted now as he had to go to this place he'd never been before, I presume or at least Mary and certainly Jesus had never been there before, Egypt. And so how long did that last? Well, we don't know for sure, but what, two or three years? And it was a risky business, wasn't it? Because we heard about Herod's decree, which ended up uh, resulting in the holy innocence, huh? those male children younger than two years or whatever it was, who were murdered. So, yes, persecution. 
Joseph then is also the model for those who are persecuted. Persecuted because of their religion. Persecuted because of their sexual identity. Could it be? Persecuted for all kinds of different reasons. But the persecuted. So, Joseph speaks to us then about how God is to be found in a very messy world. You'd think that being the stepfather of God <laughs> would make things easier for the poor guy, but it didn't. And yet, he dealt with it. I mean, with God's grace, with God's help. And it's really something something to, to wonder, wonder at. So he was obedient. What I like that word obedient sometimes, you know, it, it's it doesn't appeal to us because we think of, you know, following orders. The church in our time has been trying very valiantly with great difficulty to move beyond the moralism that has characterized the way we Catholics were raised, you know, just give me the rules and I'll obey them kind of approach to what it means to be a Catholic, you know, and they're saying, no, you know, we have to internalize and respond in love, in the whole person. And the only way that we're going to do it is if we are obedient, but not in that lockstep idea of obedience, but rather obedience, going back to the very root of the word, uh, in Latin anyway, obedire, to listen. And that takes us back to the silence huh, that we what we see uh, in Joseph, Joseph, the man of silence. Huh? What is obedience? Obedience is assimilating God's voice, God's will in our life and responding with integrity and with wholeness and trying to live life in response, attend, attending to, paying attention to, listening to, God's inspiration, huh? And the needs of others. That's being obedient, huh? In the profoundest sense of the word. So, uh, and, and anyway, and I'm going to end now because I know I've gone on too long. We speak of Joseph as a man of the shadows. I like that. He's a shadow. We've been exposed to examples of narcissism in our time, haven't we? And I won't go into that. But it's just the opposite of narcissism. You know, a, a self-centered, self-referential way of living. And the church sometimes falls into that as an institution, by the way. And that's part of the reform that Pope Francis is bringing to the church to get us out of that self referentiality. But if there ever was a model of something different, it's the man of shadows. That strong and firm and compassionate presence that doesn't call attention to itself. And so in so many ways, we look at the, at the figure of, of uh, Joseph and we say, my goodness, there's not that much said about him in the scripture, but my God, there's so much to really think about and pray about when we draw close to him. Now I'm going to uh, turn once again to uh, Sister Cecilia, and she's going to share the background, which I'm sure will really be interesting, of uh, the, the figure of Joseph uh, in the worldwide 
congregations, all the congregations of the Sisters of St. Joseph. Uh, so, Sister Cecilia. All right, so um, I have some pictures. So uh, this is um, the rose window from our Mother House Chapel, um, picture of St. Joseph. And today I'm gonna to reflect a little bit with you on how did Sisters of St. Joseph get to be Sisters of St. Joseph? Why Joseph? So the Sisters of St. Joseph today are scattered throughout the world. Um, and um, this little family tree is, shows all of the mother houses of the congregation throughout the world. And, um, and so there's some in Canada, some in the US, many in Europe. And from these mother houses, sisters are sent to many countries. Um, so we're in South America, we're basically on all the continents, I think, except Antarctica. So, um, so and all these various congregations are independent and we all share the same family root and we're all sisters of St. Joseph. So we began in 1650 with six women in a small town called Le Puy, which is in the south of France. And these six women first gathered for prayer and to minister to those in need. Um, they were encouraged to divide the neighborhood and to assess those needs and to serve the dear neighbor without distinction, meaning they weren't sent to just one class or one group of people, but to whoever was in need. Um, and though they wished to live a religious life because of the time that was barred to them, because the only religious in the church were in the cloister. They were enclosed. And, and some of these women served in an orphanage called the House of Charity of the St. Joseph Orphan Daughters. So whether um, the, the name of the group came from the orphanage or the orphanage name came from the group, we're not too sure. The spiritual father of the group was a Jesuit whose name was Jean-Pierre Madai, SJ. And he wrote the first rule for the group and he wrote the first constitution for the group. And already at the very beginning of that very first rule, Father Madai indicates that this new congregation will be all consecrated to the pure and perfect love of God and will bear the name of St. Joseph. So that St. That Joseph name was important from the beginning. Um, by the beginning of the 17th century, and we're gonna talk about this a little bit later, the development of devotion to St. Joseph. Joseph is presented as one who lives unceasingly close to Jesus. That is the model of the mystical life. So in order to function as an approved group within the church, um, the small group of women needed a bishop to approve of their institute. And the bishop that um, approved them was the Bishop of Le Puy, Henri de Maupas. And de, de Maupas was, is reputed to have had a personal devotion to St. Joseph. And it's interesting that on, it was on October 15th in 1650 that the bishop assembled the first sisters, right? And he um, gave them direction and he, and he gave them an exhortation and he placed them under the protection of St. Joseph. And he ordained that their congregation should be called the daughters or sisters of St. Joseph. So that's their first official approval within the church. It's also interesting that October 15th is the feast day of St. Teresa of Avila, who, as we will see, has a, has a pretty significant part in the story of Joseph and the church. She had a deep devotion to him. And so the sisters of St. Joseph 
are the first institute within the church to bear the name of St. Joseph. Another influence on that, in that, on that early community was St. Francis de Sales. And this very holy man was known for his practical and warm spirituality. And it was, he lived in the midst of really horrible times. And, and in, during those times, people placed an emphasis on a violent and punitive God. And he was gentle and kind and taught the love of God. And he had a special devotion to St. Joseph. So he wrote often about Joseph in his writings and he was known to keep a single holy card in his bravery. And on that holy card was a picture of the infant Jesus being carried in the arms of St. Joseph. So um, de Maupas knew Francis de Sales and was very influenced by his spirituality. So there's another Joseph connection. Another connection, another St. Joseph connection is Teresa of Avila. Now Teresa of Avila lived in the 1500s um, from 1525 to 1582. And her devotion what, to Joseph was deep. And she influenced the church a lot in increased devotion to this saint. And um, so Teresa of Avila placed the first reformed Carmelite convent she founded in Avila under the patronage of St. Joseph. And that would be true for almost all the monasteries she founded, about 10, um, that they were placed under the patronage of St. Joseph, right? Um, so so I, as I noted before, the, the first congregations given its formal approval on October 15th. Um, and and that, that October 15th date is certainly significant for the congregation to, to look at the mystical aspect of the vocation of the Sisters of St. Joseph and the mystical aspect um, of Joseph in his life. So a couple parts of our spirituality, there's so many, I could go on for hours, I won't, but there's two things I just wanna note about the spirituality of the Sisters of St. Joseph. So at the heart of the spirituality of the congregation is this notion of the two trinities. And um, the two trinities are the uncreated trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and then the created trinity of Jesus, Mary, Jesus, Mary and Joseph. So this was a pious devotion of the time. So you have the Father, and the Son and the Spirit and Jesus, Mary and Joseph, and they comprise the two trinities. And this devotion emphasized the connection between heaven and earth, between the ordinary everyday and the spiritual. And um, Madai speaks in, in the early rules of the institutes of, of the consecration to the two trinities. And what's unique about Madai is his emphasis on Joseph. So Madai, when he sets up his schema, kind of makes Joseph analogous to the Holy Spirit. So just as the Holy Spirit is all love, Joseph is the model for the sisters of, as Madai says, the most perfect love and charity among themselves and toward every kind of nature. Another emphasis of Madai in, these, in, the, in the early congregation was um, an emphasis on the virtues, on virtue, right? So Madai says the sisters are to be all consecrated to the pure and perfect love of God and bear the name of St. Joseph as being especially in love with the virtue hidden in this great saint. So the word virtue here needs to be taken in a really strong way because in the 17th century, um, virtue was about physical and moral vigor. It was not a passive word. So Joseph is the man who carries within him a vigorous and discreet holiness. He is known for his hiddenness, right? There are no words recorded in scripture that are spoken by him. 
right? However, he clearly has an important role in the Holy Family and thus in salvation history. So this hiddenness is a virtue that's highlighted for the sisters. And it was practical in light of their situation in the church, uh, women who were doing direct service. It's also instructive of the way they were to be in the world, strong and yet not drawing attention to themselves. And they're always, as Joseph did, to point beyond themselves. So now Ellen's gonna talk a little bit about um, the Jesuits in St. Joseph. Alan, you're on mute. The uh, figure of St. Joseph, I think, um, is a presence very much, I would say, in the life of uh, Jesuits. And this has been true, I think, historically uh, in different ways. And uh, what strikes me, though, are just a couple of, 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 of things that are important. Uh, First, I just want to uh, give a little anecdote about uh, my visit to Argentina when I was uh, doing research on a book that I wrote about Pope Francis. I had the opportunity to uh, visit the place where he had been uh, superior for many years and, and also had served as uh, provincial of the Argentine Jesuits uh, outside of Buenos Aires. And uh, they have preserved their his room. And uh, I came in the morning and I got a really nice tour and I met some of the Jesuits there and, and I had uh, the main meal of the day with them. And then I was going to get back on the train and go back to Buenos Aires. Uh, however, this incredible rainstorm broke. I mean, it really was extraordinary. And they said, oh, you're not going to go out in that, are you? You know, you, there's, there's trains all the time. So why don't you just stay and, uh, you know, have a siesta after, after the, the meal at around one in the afternoon, uh, have, a, have a siesta. And I said, well, okay, I'll do that. So he says, we'll put you into Francis's or to uh, Jorge's, Jorge Bergoglio, into Jorge's room. And I said, oh, really? Okay. So I go there and there it is, very neat, very austere, like a good Jesuit austere. And uh, uh, so I get in the bed and uh, I'm taking my little siesta and I'm looking around. There's not much to see in there, really. However, for the first time in my life, I saw the, the statue of Joseph the Dreamer, Joseph sleeping. And I found out that in Argentina, and I don't know whether there, this had developed in any other part of the world, but in Argentina, they have a devotion to Joseph as a dreamer, Joseph as a sleeping and as a dreamer. So I'm going to ask uh, Michael McNaught to help us to put up that. There he is. Uh, you probably have seen this by now because I think it's kind of gone around. But um, what's the point of this? Well, it goes back to something I was sharing earlier, you know, about um, the way in which uh, Joseph's whole being was assimilating and receiving, that's a good word, receiving uh, God's grace, God's inspiration, uh, the different ways that God was moving him to respond lovingly and in a compassionate way to his role, uh, to his responsibilities uh, as foster father of Jesus. And that that uh, process is taking place uh, not just in the mind, you know, cognitively or is a, some kind of a rational process, but it's taking place really in the whole being and most especially in, uh, in the affect, in the deepest desires and in the longings and in the emotions, yes, the fears, and the joys and all these other things. And that the dreams, as we know, are places where sometimes we get more in contact with that aspect of our existence than, than any other place. Uh, and so Joseph was a dreamer 
Uh, and in his dreams, he found support and he found confidence and he found the way forward by paying attention to those dreams. Uh, that gave him direction in his life. And um, that's why I want to say that perhaps the, the connection with Joseph and the Jesuits has something to do with the receptivity that Joseph uh, exhibited and exemplified in his life, the receptivity to God's action. In other words, um, he wasn't uh, just acting and waiting to be rewarded. That wasn't the, the, the nature of his relationship with God, the way sometimes I'm afraid we tend to think of it. You know, if I do X, Y, Z, God will reward me and I'll go to heaven or something. But rather that the better way to think of our relationship with God is God is approaching me. God is, is entering into my life. Uh, God is making God's self known to me. And yes, then I, I must find the loving response to how God is entering into my life. And it seems to me that uh, St. Ignatius in Spiritual Exercises uh, is really providing us with the, you know, a help to understand how we can get in touch with that whole aspect of grace. Uh, you know, the, for instance, the first principle and foundation in the very first week of spiritual exercises uh, brings us to the point where we see ourselves in relationship to God, you know, that we're creatures, creatures. In other words, that our existence is not our own doing, but is always God's doing, and that God's grace is always, uh, well, prevenient, you know, it's coming before, as St. Augustine would say, it, it's always there. Uh, God is always near, even when we are not near. God is always drawing close to us. Huh? That's why, among other things, uh, Pope Francis likes to use the word in Spanish, cercanía, the nearness. Huh? He tried to emphasize the, near, emphasize the nearness of God. And it's true that uh, one time he was talking about how he likes to pray. He gave the example, I thought it was interesting, and I've actually started to pray that way a, a bit myself. He, he doesn't worry about uh, his, um, uh, you know, talking to God or making himself present to God in his prayer as much as he does in God, recognizing that God is present to him. And in order to do that, he, he has an image of Jesus that he puts in front of him when he prays, Jesus looking at him. Uh, and he just remains there in silence, trying to grasp the, the significance of the fact that God is always drawing near. And God, we may not pay attention to God, but God's paying attention to us. So how do we respond to that? Well, Joseph, it seems to me, was responsive huh, to the fact that God was drawing near to him in so many different ways. So this um, receptivity, this fantastic receptivity, uh, Joseph, you know, maybe if you compare Joseph to some kind of a radio or something, you know, trying to uh, somehow deal, uh, receive the, the uh, radio waves, you know, and to hear them and to make sense out of them, uh, he was attuned, an attuned person. And, and I think in our Ignatian way of thinking, it's about being always in, attuned to where the Lord is leading you. That's why we emphasize forms of prayer, for instance, like the examination of consciousness, you know, that allows us to be uh, uh, in tune with God, despite all the distractions and what have you that's going on. And that uh, Joseph really was a good example of that quality. And then on a much, I guess, lighter note, not so heavy a consideration as what I just shared with you about Joseph and, and our Jesuit and Ignatian spirituality. Uh, 
just a, a couple of anecdotes about California or Western province Jesuits. You know, uh, I entered in Montecito, California in a novitiate back in those years, uh, close to Santa Barbara. And uh, if any of you had ever been there, you realize it was really a wonderful piece of uh, real estate that the Jesuits that we were able to obtain in order to have our, our novitiate, which in those years, you know, the, the norm was pretty much away from everything, that kind of thing. That's why it was way up there in, in Santa Barbara. Anyway, it was 120 acres in the foothills of the Santa Ines Mountains, looking down on the Pacific Ocean. And uh, actually, we had a chance to, to get it, paying the price that we could pay, which is not the price that a lot of other people could pay, who really want that, wanted that property. But the man in charge of this transaction for our province at the time was Father Vondera. Uh, you may have heard of Father the, the Vondras. They're great Catholic philanthropists of uh, Southern California. And there's a couple of buildings here at LMU named after the Vondera family. Anyway, Father Carl uh, was uh, in charge of this thing. And uh, he spotted this wonderful opportunity up in Montecito. And so he was always very quick to tell people after we got, we did get the property at a price that we could pay, which was incredibly, incredibly low. Um, he said, it was all St. Joseph's doing. And we said, oh, really? How was that, Father? Well, the minute I we decided that we were going to try to, to gain, get that property, I went up there secretly and I buried a statue of Joseph with his head upside down in the, on, a, on that property. And, and I prayed and I prayed and lo and behold, it worked. So I said, well, that's, that's really something, you know, I hadn't experienced such an expression of, of simple belief and piety, you know, in the a Jesuit like that before, but it was great, great to see. Uh, similarly, um, we had uh, a very nice place up in Northern California that someone gave us, uh, a donor gave us where we could uh, get take recreation for our men in formation up in the uh, Santa Cruz mountains. And uh, in our novitiate in Los Gatos, even to this very day, I mean, our residence in Los Gatos, which is now our uh, residence for the elderly Jesuits, um, we have a, um, candle that's burning on the right altar, the St. Joseph altar, and it's green. I'm not sure why it's green, but anyway, it's, it's in a green glass and it's there all the time. And we, we ask, you know, wh why is that candle lit all the time? Because the only condition that that donor gave us that, that piece of property was that we would honor St. Joseph and that we would always have a candle lit at that altar, you know? And so, yes, this is a, a small example of simple devotion uh, to another quality, of course, that all the saints have, but which St. Joseph seems to have uh, in spades, which is power, power to intercede, huh? to intercede for us as he has in the lives of so many people. As a matter of fact, when, when Sister Cecilia was talking about uh, the role that St. Teresa of Avila played. One of the reasons that uh, she was such a great fan of Joseph is that in her reflection and prayer on the person of Joseph and what we knew of him, uh, she discovered that Joseph actually uh, was somebody that you could ask for anything. Whereas in the church, there always was, you know, a, a tendency to identify a saint with just one thing or, or another, or one kind of help, one kind of, of, uh, of assistance, you know, when people are in need. Well, she said, Joseph was such a universal uh, presence in the life of Jesus and in the life of the church that you could literally ask him for anything. And she said, well, if that's the case, I'm going to go for Joseph. And so uh, she proposed and, and gave, gave importance to the development of the devotion to Joseph in the, in the 16th and 17th century, huh? that impacted 
uh, the Sisters of St. Joseph later on. Thank you. So Sister Cecilia. Yes. You have some more. I have some more pictures. And you have some more pictures. You have some more art, which Thank is a you. wonderful way to get into this, I would say. I mean, this is fantastic. So. Oh, thank you. Go ahead. All right, thank you. Um, so we're gonna look, I mean, um, Joseph is, it's, it's kind of interesting that um, he was not always all that popular um, in the church. Um, and we're gonna look at why, and we're gonna, and we're gonna do this by looking at pretty pictures. So I hope you enjoyed looking at these as much as I enjoyed finding them. So in scripture, Joseph is mentioned 15 times. Um, he's, uh, he's not noted, you know, there's nothing about him during Jesus's public life, except, except, um, except some mention of him, you know, this is, is this Joseph's son, the son of the carpenter. However, it seems that by that point, he wasn't alive or a factor in Jesus's life, because certainly Jesus's mother is mentioned in scripture. So let's look at some pictures of Joseph through the ages and look at what they can tell us about what the church's imagination was about him during different times. So this is a mosaic um, from St. Mary Major in Rome, and it, it's a uh, circa about 440, okay? And um, Joseph does show up here. Let me, let me find him. Oh, here he is right so you notice he's kind of a side guy he's an also ran he is not very important and at least he's there and for a for a while after this in in church art and in church devotion joseph kind of disappears and part of the reason he disappears is because um some people were a little uncomfortable with his role, with his role as 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 foster father of Jesus, um, they they uh, they weren't really sure about what his relationship to Mary really was, so they just kind of sidelined and ignored him. So here's an example of that. This is a this is an um, an image from about 600 in Saint Catherine's Monastery. And here we have a lovely nativity with a cross-eyed cow. And down here in the very far left-hand corner is Joseph, right? And he, he's not connected with the rest of the family and he looks pretty worried. The Jesuits would say he's worried about where he's gonna send his kid to school. But <laughs> um, this is a common kind of theme, right? That, that Joseph is in, if he's in the nativity scene at all, He's certainly pretty much sidelined and he's not important. And he certainly doesn't show up in stories or in devotions or in art of his own. He's, he's only in these kind of scriptural representations and then he's a minor character. And here's another example, right? And here we have the finding of, 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 of the child Jesus in the, in the um, in the temple in about 900 and poor Joseph doesn't even get a halo. He's so unimportant. So you can see that the, 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 the devotion to Joseph just was not a big thing in the church. And it wasn't particularly because of his small role in scripture because a lot of other saints who weren't even scriptural like Veronica, for example, had big devotions and big followings. It was more, um, people wanted to highlight the Blessed Virgin Mary. And so they made him, um, they weren't devoted to him at all. And he was certainly someone who was not too important. Okay, so here we are in the 1270s and we have the flight into Egypt. And in many of these early pictures of, of Joseph, he's kind of old and decrepit. Here he, um, doesn't even have enough energy on the flight into Egypt to lead, I think that's a donkey, to lead the donkey. He's kind of following behind, um, kind of trailing behind the whole thing. So 
this is where we get, you know, the cherry tree car carol is not my favorite, but this is where we get these notions of Joseph as a very old man. Um, and part of that again is, you know, to emphasize, you know, that, that, you know, he and Mary wouldn't have been attracted to each other really. There are legends that he was um, married before and that, that uh, the brothers and sisters of Joseph were actually his children from his first marriage. Now, later on, some of the saints are gonna dispute that, but, and that story is pretty common in the Orthodox church. So, so, but he's shown as an old man who certainly wouldn't have been any kind of, a, of an attraction or a threat to Mary's virginity. Then by the beginning of 1300s, right, we begin, we're starting to get a little bit more reflection and he's getting, he's getting a little bit more stature. This is a, this is a um, famous picture by Giotto in one of his monumental cycle of frescoes on the life of the Virgin um, in Padua. And notice he's still older, right? He's still, he gets his halo, he gets a halo. He's still older, but he's certainly much more vigorous and much more lively and much more attractive and much more at the center of the picture. He's no longer just on the sidelines. So things are beginning to shift a little bit. And then here's this lily with the bird on it, right? And, and you'll see this lily a lot in these pictures. And, and what it is, is, um, is there was an account in a book called The Golden Legend, which was a lives of the saint in the Middle Ages. And in The Golden Legend, um, 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 when Mary came of age, the priest was told to summon all the marriageable men to the temple with their rods, and they would be given a sign which, which guy was the guy, which man was to be betrothed to Mary. And Joseph was chosen just as a lily sprouted from his rod and a dove landed on top of it. So, so these are both symbols of purity. Um, and, and so, but it's interesting in that gold, famous golden legend, Joseph doesn't have an entry of his own. He's only mentioned as in entries about Mary. Hmm. So by the 15th century, uh, uh, Joseph is, people are becoming more interested in, devo in devotions to Joseph. And part of that, um, um, part of what propelled him to saintly stardom were the calamities of the 14th and 15th century. So what, what do we have? We have famine, right? We have the Hundred Years War. We have civil wars. We have peasants and urban artisans revolting. We have heresies and corruption in the church, the great schism, the Babylonian captivity of the church. And then just to make things interesting, we have the Black Death that kills a quarter of Europe's people in its first assault alone. <laughs> so the theologians and the popular preachers turn the spotlight to Joseph as the ideal family man, model, and protector. So in these little vignettes, he's definitely younger, he's more engaged, and he's kindly. And so the Feast of St. Joseph did not enter the Western calendar until AD 1479. There was no Feast of St. Joseph. So a turn begins and he begins to become more popular. So by the 1500s, right, um, he is coming more into his own. He actually gets to touch the baby. Notice that, um, that was a good thing. And this is an interesting picture because the baby and the baby Jesus and Joseph are both asleep and Mary is awake adoring them both. So this is this is was a representation of the artist that you know Joseph was kind of the earthly father, the one who um, was human, and and Mary was focused on Jesus's divinity. Or, so and Jesus, of course, is facing out to face you and me. So this is a really sweet picture, and so we begin to get more art like this 
after the 1500s. By 1645, we're into the Baroque period, and Joseph is the stalwart family state, um, and this will mesh nicely with the Counter-Reformation's um, st st strategies for re-evangelizing Christendom. So it's about his strength and his dignity and his fatherhood and and his being the key to the harmonious holy family. And so and in this picture, you can see um, the awe and respect that Jesus has for his father. In the new world, this is a picture from Cusco in, in um, the 1670s, right? So now he's, again, we're seeing, as we saw in that last picture, he isn't only just showing up with Mary. He's, he's not the peripheral character with only with Mary. He's showing up with the child um, and he's at the center of the work, right? And, um, and he, um, he was very popular in Mexico and in the Andes because of his, um, because he was known as a healer. And at this time and back into the time of the Black Death, he had been known as the patron of Saint of the Dying. So he's very attractive to, to the new Christians in the new world. And there's a lot of lovely and charming pictures of him um, with the child Jesus that come from this period. And notice, notice his face, notice he's younger. There's the lilies again. He's younger, he's vigorous, um, and devotion to him is growing. And by 1727, he gets to appear all by himself with no baby and no Mary. Here he is with the Trinity and, um, um, and, a, and a, a Franciscan saint, Fran Francesco di Paola, and, um, and so he's reached a level of devotion where he can hold his own. By the 19th century, um, we see him reflected in art in a really, um, in, in a way that goes with the period, okay? So an artist would often would choose a scriptural theme, but he would plummet for its psychological or political symbolism. And so this is called The Flight into Egypt, and it's by uh, Luke Oliver Merson. And here we see um, Joseph having come full circle. He's very, he's an exhausted refugee, right? Mary, Jesus is asleep in Mary's arms on the, uh, um, on the Sphinx, right? Which did raise a little hue and cry because that was a pagan statue. And Joseph is by, the, is by the dying campfire. And this picture attracted people because it was so human. And it, 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 represented, it, it represented the psych, psychological feeling of what the family must have experienced on the flight into Egypt. And it was also, um, it was also a picture that appealed politically because a lot of Catholic immigrants of the era um, who had witnessed a lot of persecution saw a picture like this and, and thought of the reality of the protection of the exhausted Joseph, that he stayed with his family and, and it helped them to have courage in their own duties to their families. In the 20th century in 1955, the Feast of St. Joseph the Worker was promulgated by Pope Pius the, the 12th and it's observed on May 1st. And this feast was added because of communist May Day. But it's interesting because now we see Joseph coming into his own with his own patronage, not connected to the Holy Family. He's, and it, it offer, he offers a Christian view of labor and a prime example of what it means to be a worker and the dignity of work. 
And our last picture is a very contemporary one. This one is from 2013. Um, and it is um, called St. Joseph and Jesus by Christopher Santer. And you see here the current sense of the devotion to St. Joseph, um, how much Jesus loved him, how much he loved Jesus. The psalm in the background is um, from Psalm 89, 29. I will establish his line forever and his thrones as the days of, of the heavens. So it's the whole idea of the intimacy that Joseph had with Jesus. And the devotion is based on the fact that we can turn to him as one who understands our human condition and one who loved and was loved by his son. Thank you, Cecilia. So that's what I have. Thank you so much. Yeah. Well, I want to thank you both as well uh, for, for sharing your insights with us, with us tonight. And hold on one sec. And there we go. And uh, on behalf of the center, I want to thank everyone for, for uh, tuning in tonight. Uh, you can see we have a, a list of events that are coming up and in the chat, uh, dun, 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 where's the chat? I'm going to put the link to, uh, to, the, to, to these events. All righty. Um, so stay tuned with that for our, our we have just, just this Saturday, we've got an event with Jim, Dr. Jim Finley and, and several others coming up in the coming weeks. Uh, as we celebrate just as we celebrate Holy Week and move into the Easter season. Thank you all for being with us and we look forward to, to joining us for our future events as well. Good night. <laughs>